Welcome back to another episode from our little impromptu mini-series where I'm bringing you Christmas from the quarantine. If you're just joining, I'm committed to bringing you a new episode every day for as long as we're all on lockdown. First things first, I hope that you're safe and healthy. I hope that you're following all of the common sense guidelines and that you're taking your advice only from trained medical professionals. And I hope that you're treating this with the seriousness it deserves. Unfortunately, not everyone is, and that just might mean that this lasts longer than it needs to. So please, be smart, stay positive, and look out for one another. Now in yesterday's episode, I read you an essay from Washington Irving's old Christmas collection. There are five pieces in that collection, and for the next consecutive four days, I'll be reading you the rest of them. But Christmas from the Quarantine won't be all story time, although there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I have plenty of other classic Christmas stories queued up to read for you, and a couple of contemporary ones as well. But I'll be bringing you some interviews and collaborations with my other friends in the Christmas podcasting world. Again, you can look for a new episode every day in your podcast feed until we are all out of this because now more than ever, we could all use a little Christmas spirit. And with that in mind, I have a little favor to ask you. If you know someone who would enjoy this show, please tell them about it, or leave a review for it on Apple Podcasts. Both of those are really quick and painless ways to show your support, and they really do make a big difference of bringing more members into the Christmas Past family. The piece I'm reading today is called The Stagecoach, and it kind of picks up where yesterday's piece left off. I'll come back at the end to say goodbye, But for now, please enjoy The Stagecoach from Washington Irving's Old Christmas. In the preceding paper, I have made some general observations on the Christmas festivities of England and am tempted to illustrate them by some anecdotes of a Christmas past in the country, in pursuing which I would most courteously invite my reader to lay aside the austerity of wisdom and to put on that genuine holiday spirit which is tolerant of folly and anxious only for amusement. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. The coach was crowded both inside and out with passengers who, by their talk, seemed principally bound to the mansions of relations or friends to eat the Christmas dinner. It was loaded also with hampers of game and baskets and boxes of delicacies, and hares hung dangling their long ears about the coachman's box. Presents from distant friends for the impending feast. I had three fine rosy-cheeked schoolboys for my fellow passengers inside full of the buxom health and manly spirit which I have observed in the children of this country. They were returning home for the holiday in high glee and promising themselves a world of enjoyment. It was delightful to hear the gigantic plans of pleasure of the little rogues and the impracticable feats they were to perform during their six weeks emancipation from the abhorred thraldom of book, birch, and pedagogue. They were full of anticipations of the meeting with the family and household, down to the very cat and dog, and to the joy that they were to give their little sisters by the presents with which their pockets were crammed. But the meeting to which they seemed to look forward with the greatest impatience was with Bantam, which I found to be a pony, and, according to their talk, possessed of more virtues than any steed since the days of Bucephalus. How he could trot! how he could run, and then such leaps as he would take, there was not a hedge in the whole country that he could not clear. They were under the particular guardianship of the coachman, to whom, whenever an opportunity presented, they addressed a host of questions and pronounced him one of the best fellows in the whole world. Indeed, I could not but notice the more than ordinary air of bustle and importance of the coachman who wore his hat a little to one side and had a large bunch of Christmas green stuck in the buttonhole of his coat. He was always a personage of full and mighty care and business, but he was particularly so during this season, having so many commissions to execute in consequence of the great interchange of presents. And here, perhaps, it may not be unacceptable to my untraveled readers to have a sketch that may serve as a general representation of this very numerous and important class of functionaries, who have a dress, a manner, a language, an air, peculiar to themselves and prevalent throughout the fraternity, 
so that wherever an English stage coachman may be seen, he cannot be mistaken for one of any other craft or mystery. He has commonly a broad, full face, curiously mottled with red as if the blood were being forced by hard feeding into every vessel of the skin. He is swelled into jolly dimensions by frequent potations of malt liquors, and his bulk is still further increased by a multiplicity of coats in which he is buried like a cauliflower, the upper one reaching to his heels. He wears a broad-brimmed, low-crowned hat, a huge roll of colored handkerchief around his neck, knowingly knotted and tucked in at the bosom, and has in summertime a large bouquet of flowers in his buttonhole the present, most probably, of some enamored country lass. His waistcoat is commonly of some bright color, striped, and his small clothes extend far below his knees to meet a pair of jockey boots, which reach about halfway up his legs. All his costume is maintained with such precision. He has a pride in having his clothes of excellent materials, and notwithstanding the seeming grossness of his appearance, there is still discernible that neatness and propriety of person, which is almost inherent in an Englishman. He enjoys great consequence and consideration along the road. He has frequent conferences with the village housewives, who look upon him as a man of great trust and dependence. And he seems to have a good understanding with every bright-eyed country lass. The moment he arrives where the horses are to be changed, he throws down the reins with something of an air, and abandons the cattle to the care of the ostler, his duty being merely to drive from one stage to another. When off the box his hands are thrust in his pockets of his greatcoat, and he rolls about the inn-yard with an air of the most absolute lordliness. Here he is generally surrounded by an admiring throng of ostlers, stable boys, shoe blacks, and those nameless hangers-on that infest inns and taverns, and run errands and do all kinds of odd jobs, for the privilege of battening on the drippings of the kitchen and the leakage of the taproom. These all look up to him as an oracle, treasure up his cant phrases, echo his opinions about horses and other topics of jockey lore, and, above all, endeavor to imitate his air and carriage. Every ragamuffin that has a coat to his back thrusts his hands in his pockets, rolls in his gait, talks slang, and is an embryo coachy. Perhaps it might be owing to the pleasing serenity that reigned in my own mind that I fancied I saw cheerfulness in every countenance throughout the journey. A stagecoach, however, carries animation always with it, and puts the world in motion as it whirls along. The horn sounded at the entrance of a village produces a general bustle. Some hasten forth to meet friends, some with bundles and bandboxes to secure places, and in the hurry of the moment can hardly take leave of the group that accompanies them. In the meantime, the coachman has a world of small commissions to execute. Sometimes he delivers a hare or pheasant, sometimes jerks a small parcel of newspapers to the door of a public house, and sometimes, with knowing leer and words of sly import, hands to some half-blushing, half-laughing housemaid an odd-shaped billet doux from some rustic admirer. As the coach rattles through the village, everyone runs to the window, and you have glances on every side of fresh country faces and blooming, giggling girls. At the corners are assembled juntas of village idlers and wise men, who take their stations there for the important purpose of seeing company pass. But the sagest knot is generally at the blacksmiths, to whom the passing of the coach is an event fruitful of much speculation. The smith, with the horse's heel in his lap, pauses as the vehicle whirls by. The cyclops round the anvil suspends their ringing hammers, and suffer the iron to grow cool and the sooty specter in brown paper cup, laboring at the bellows, leans on the handle for a moment and permits the asthmatic engine to heave a long-drawn sigh, while he glances through the murky smoke and sulfurous gleam of the smithy. Perhaps the impending holiday might have given a more than usual animation to the country, for it seemed to me as if everyone was in good looks and good spirits. Game, poultry, and other luxuries of the table were in brisk circulation in the villages. The grocers, butchers, and fruiters' shops were thronged with customers. The housewives were stirring briskly about, putting their dwellings in order, and the glossy branches of holly with their bright red berries began to appear at the windows. 
The scene brought to mind an old writer's account of Christmas preparations. Now capons and hens, beside turkeys, geese, and ducks with beef and mutton, must all die, for in twelve days a multitude of people will not be fed with a little. Now plums and spice, sugar and honey, square it among pies and broth. Now or never must music be in tune, for the youth must dance and sing to get them a heat while the aged sit by the fire. The country maid leaves half her market, and must be sent again if she forgets a pack of cards on Christmas Eve. Great is the contention of holly and ivy, whether master or dame wears the breeches. Dice and cards benefit the butler, and if the cook do not lack wit, he will sweetly lick his fingers. I was roused from this fit of luxurious meditation by a shout from my little traveling companions. They had been looking out of the coach windows for the last few miles, recognizing every tree and cottage as they approached home. And now there was a general burst of joy. There is John, and there is old Carlo, and there is Bantam, cried the happy little rogues clapping their hands. At the end of the lane there was an old, sober-looking servant in livery waiting for them. He was accompanied by a superannuated pointer and by the redoubtable Bantam, a little old rat of a pony with a shaggy mane and a long rusty tail, who stood dozing quietly by the roadside, little dreaming of the bustling times that awaited him. I was pleased to see the fondness with which the little fellows leaped about the steady old footman and hugged the pointer who wriggled his whole body for joy. But Bantam was the great object of interest. All wanted to mount at once, and it was with some difficulty that John arranged that they should ride by turns and the eldest should ride first. Off they set at last, one on the pony, with the dog bounding and barking before them, and the others holding John's hands, both talking at once and overpowering him by questions about home and with school anecdotes. I looked after them with a feeling in which I did not know whether pleasure or melancholy predominated, for I was reminded of those days when, like them, I had neither known care nor sorrow, and a holiday was the summit of earthly felicity. We stopped for a few moments afterward to water the horses, and on returning our route, a turn of the road brought us in sight of a neat country seat. I could just distinguish the forms of a lady and two young girls in the portico, and I saw my little comrades with Bantam, Carlo, and old John trooping along the carriage road. I leaned out of my coach window in hopes of witnessing the happy meeting, but a grove of trees shut it from my sight. In the evening we reached a village where I had determined to pass the night. As we drove into the great gateway of the inn I saw on one side the light of a rousing kitchen fire beaming through the window. I entered and admired for the hundredth time that picture of convenience, neatness, and broad, honest enjoyment, the kitchen of an English inn. It was of spacious dimensions, hung round with copper and tin vessels highly polished, and decorated here and there with a Christmas green. Hams, tongues, and flitches of bacon were suspended from the ceiling. A smokejack made its ceaseless clanking beside the fireplace, and a clock ticked in one corner. A well-scoured deal table extended along the side of the kitchen, and a cold round of beef with other hearty viands upon it, over which two foaming tankards of ale seemed mounting guard. The travelers of inferior order were prepared to attack this stout repast, while others sat smoking and gossiping over their ale on two high-backed oaken seats beside the fire. Trim housemaids were hurrying backward and forward under the directions of a fresh, bustling landlady, but still seizing on occasional moments to exchange a flippant word and have a rallying laugh with the group around the fire. The scene completely realized poor Robin's humble idea of the comforts of midwinter. Now trees their leafy hats do bear to reverence winter's silver hair. A handsome hostess, merry host, a pot of ale, and now a toast. Tobacco and a good coal fire are things this season doth require. I had not been long at the inn when a post chaise drove up to the door. A young gentleman stepped out, and by the light of the lamps I caught a glimpse of a countenance which I thought I knew. I moved forward to get a nearer view, and when his eye caught mine I was not mistaken. It was Frank Bracebridge, a sprightly good-humored young fellow with whom I had once traveled on the continent. 
Our meeting was extremely cordial, for the countenance of an old fellow traveler always brings up the recollection of a thousand pleasant scenes, odd adventures, and excellent jokes. To discuss all of these in a transient interview at an inn was impossible, and finding that I was not pressed for time and was merely making a tour of observation, he insisted that I should give him a day or two at his father's country seat, to which he was going to pass the holidays, and which lay at a few miles distance. It's better than eating a solitary Christmas dinner at an inn, said he, and I can assure you of a hearty welcome in something of an old-fashioned style. His reasoning was cogent, and I must confess the preparation I had seen for universal festivity and social enjoyment had made me feel a little impatient of my loneliness. I closed, therefore, at once with his invitation. The chaise drove up to the door, and in a few moments I was on my way to the family mansion of the Bracebridges. Thanks very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that. I'm discovering these works of Washington Irving in real time along with you. Even I don't know what happens next, although I'm sure it's just as Christmassy as the two that preceded it. So join me again tomorrow for the next installment from Washington Irving's Old Christmas. Again, we're going to keep going until all five are complete, and then we'll move on to something else. Maybe it'll be another story, maybe it will be an interview, maybe it will be a roundtable discussion about something Christmassy. Whatever it is, I'm committed to bringing you a new episode every day for the foreseeable future in these uncertain weeks and months ahead. So until tomorrow, let me remind you that Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. If you have anything you'd like to share with the Christmas Past family, why not record it into a voice memo and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to share it on an upcoming episode. Or you can use that email address to just drop me a line and say hi anytime. I always love to hear from you. You can also reach me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and now's as good a time as any to join the private Facebook group. We're sharing Christmas content there all the time, and I'd love to welcome you in. Your support really does make a big difference for the show, so if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, please help more people discover Christmas Past. It's as simple as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you do leave a review on Apple Podcasts, I'll even send you an official Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card to say thanks. Get in touch with me for details on that. Until tomorrow, stay safe and healthy, and may your days be merry and bright.